We are a society that is undercover. This podcast is about lifting that cover and seeing what's underneath, the network of things and meanings that connect us all and make us human. Welcome back to the Undercover Podcast. This is our second episode of the podcast. I'm Aidan Dawkins. Society's response to COVID-19 has escalated across the last fortnight. Global cases have now surpassed 1 million. Most countries see their citizens trapped inside as self-isolation and social distancing move from being recommendations to being set out in the law. This is a defining moment in the history of humanity. Generations ahead will look back on 2020 and discuss this disruption, this panic and the response. And hopefully some of the good, like community spirit and the acts of generosity we're seeing, will also last the test of time. But for us personally, how will we remember it? What stories will we tell our children and our grandchildren of our time trapped indoors? Will it be how I escaped your mother or perhaps how I escaped your father? We are all facing our unique circumstances and a lot of them can be quite confronting and lonely. Our hope through this podcast is that you will not feel alone. And even in the worst of these stories, they can be all of ours to share, that we can be in this together. RMIT Journalism welcomes you to the Undercover Podcast. We're not trying to be another name in a podcast app or climb any charts. We just want to be a familiar voice, a phone call between friends, and a voicemail left for tomorrow. We'd love to hear your story, or even just a quick thought on what you're going through right now. Give us a call and leave a message on 039018-5005. Tell us how you're navigating it. What are you thinking about? How are you feeling? What have you experienced? We'd love to include your message in a future episode. If you're comfortable, please leave your name and number so we can get back in touch. And head over to our Twitter, at cover underscore podcast. Maybe DM us a video. Show us what your isolation looks like. Each of our episodes has its own theme, a way of looking around at what's happening through different lenses. This episode, our theme is Trapped. Our reporters have put together stories about all segments of society. We will look at the elderly, dating in isolation, and how the music industry has been impacted. We will check in on how scammers are making the most of tragedy, and have a look at loneliness in social distancing. But first up, Being told to stay home as a result of the COVID-19 restrictions has left many Victorians with itchy feet. For now, staying home is our safest option to ensure our health and safety. But for those in the community experiencing family violence, home is often the most unsafe place that they can be. Where can victims go when everyone is being told to stay home? A warning, the following story includes descriptions of violence against women in abusive relationships. Alexandra Middleton reports. very lucky to be here today because I've he's nearly killed me on so many occasions. Diana is a survivor, a survivor of domestic violence. She can't imagine what victims of abuse are experiencing now under COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. To now have a double whammy of COVID-19 and a partner that's violent, well, I can't imagine. I just can't imagine how they're coping. 100% scarier. Yeah, just so terrified that these women don't even know where to go or if it's safe to go somewhere because, I mean, of course, you've now got the fear of domestic violence, the fear of the coronavirus. Diana moved to Australia from New Zealand with her husband and two young children in the early 2000s. They bought land in regional Victoria and made their living out of dairy farming. It was their dream. But that dream quickly turned into a nightmare when her husband started taking out his stress and frustration on Diana. I'd, you know, I'd end up being the, you know, his sort of stress release for that. So I'd be, you know, get hit and held up against the concrete wall, nearly, you know, choking me to death. In the era of COVID-19, 
where there seems to be a myriad of things out of our control, Diana says victims of family violence can't do anything to fix the situation. Most victims know what's coming. And this is what is so scary, and this is where I relate it so much to what's happening now, because these poor people, are going to, these women are going to be knowing what's going to be coming. It's worse than walking on eggshells. It's such a fear that you know what's coming. In the end, as our kids got older too, he got worse. So he used to take it out on my son then as well. So my son was in year 12. And, um, yeah, he went to kill my son for no reason, just because my son didn't um, get the cows in fast enough. Uh, So, yeah, he went to do that, and I stepped in the way and took the front of the beating and called the police. In Victoria, current COVID-19 restrictions mean we can't leave our homes except for essential reasons. Thousands of Australians are being forced to work from home or have lost their jobs entirely. CEO of Macaulay Services for Women, Jocelyn Bignold, says this only adds to the stress of being trapped in an unsafe home and that businesses aware of employees who are experiencing family violence should create a safe work environment through applying social distancing rules so family violence victims are not forced to work from home. For women experiencing family violence, women and children that is, um, home is often the most unsafe place they can be and they often rely on being at work as a safe place. So... You know, physical distancing can be applied easily in these empty workforces. Perhaps, you know, one of the, one of the big things that the business can, can do is think through the unintended consequence of shifting everybody out of the workforce and into home. As well as having to work from home or not work at all, many Australians can't visit their families and friends during lockdown. But communicating with parents, siblings and friends is the kind of support domestic violence victims rely on. The Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's 2019 report states that women temporarily leaving violent partners are likely to stay with a friend or relative. Having moved from New Zealand, Diana has experienced the heartbreaking feeling of not being able to reach out to family for support. Yes, so I didn't have family and that's why I sort of understand as well with these the families now experience family violence that they won't be able to go to their parents. I mean, they're putting the parents at risk. So you would think, I mean, you could still go there, but it's that whole thing, you're putting them at risk. So I understand that feeling that I had nowhere to go. And um, I think I think that's why I'm sort of thinking, well, this is very similar for many people now because they're not going to have anywhere to go because it's like now you don't really have a family. Yeah, sure, you can ring them and everything, but it's the safety thing and it's the knowing you can get out. There's no out. Jocelyn hopes women currently in lockdown with abusive partners can maintain communication with the world outside their homes. If they can keep contact with a trusted family member or friend or neighbour or indeed their employer so that uh, they can send a signal if things are getting worse and they feel their risk levels are um, heightened. It really is trying to keep um, a line of communication to the outside world. Although there are family violence services like Macaulay and Safe Steps available to family violence victims in Victoria, Jocelyn believes affected women are too afraid or unable to reach out to family violence helplines. It's actually extremely difficult for her to make any moves or make any phone calls to to get help. One of the um, underlying features of um, family violence is coercive control. So that can mean he's watching everything she does and controls every move, every phone call that she makes. What our state services are saying is that they're not getting the volume of calls that they expected. Um, or are still expecting because everybody's at home. They, they could be in danger if they make a call. Services like Safe Steps are expecting an increase in domestic violence-related calls going straight to police instead of a helpline. What we would hope that they would be able to do is, if in fear of their lives, to, to make that call to Triple O. The federal government recently announced it would allocate $150 million to support Australians experiencing domestic, 
family and sexual violence. A new public communication campaign will also roll out to support those experiencing domestic violence over this period, ensuring those affected know where they can seek help. The surge in online searches for domestic violence services since lockdown, combined with the increase in searches over the last five years, contributed to the government's decision. I mean, the government sector is putting a lot of money towards this and it's very, very good to see that family violence is front and centre of their thinking, both federally and state. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, in 2016 and 2017, 4,600 women and 1,700 men over the age of 15 were hospitalised as a result of family violence. In Australia, domestic violence kills one man every 29 days and one woman every nine days. With domestic violence figures continuously rising, it's important to think about what the numbers will look like once we recover from the coronavirus. So now what we're starting to understand is um, you know, there is financial control, there is psychological control, there's the, um, the very dangerous behaviour that can lead to murder. While COVID-19 restrictions continue indefinitely, victims of domestic violence remain trapped in their homes. How can we help those in our community who are most vulnerable? How can we begin to understand those who find their homes more threatening than the coronavirus? It's a pandemic already, and I'm just thinking, how? How are we going to, as a nation, get this domestic violence under control? Alexandra Middleton there with that story. If you or anyone you know needs help, please call 1800 RESPECT. That's 1800 737 732. If it's an emergency situation, please call triple zero. Our next story looks at loneliness and social distancing. During the last month, we've adjusted to a new normal, one of staying at home and being socially distant to help slow the spread of the coronavirus. The term social distancing has become part of society's everyday vernacular, but the phrase is proving to be a lot more isolating than intended. In the time of a pandemic, mental health is just as important as our physical health. And experts are now stating that we should be using phrases such as physical distancing to reduce the feelings of loneliness and isolation. Phoebe Humphrey has the story. Coming home and being home for so long and being restricted from basically seeing anyone apart from being able to go out on a long walk, I think really just makes you like, oh, how do I explain this? I guess like you feel like you're in your own head a lot. That was 20-year-old Marley Dean. She describes herself as a social person. She goes to the gym, catches up with her friends a few times a week, and on most weekends you would find her out enjoying the nightlife. But like the majority of young adults, she is learning what it's like to live in isolation. It's 10pm on a Saturday, and Marley is going through her typical Saturday night routine. She listened to music, laughed, and had a drink with her close friends. But this time, she did it online. <laughs> oh. And she got really scared and she like tried to dart out of the cinema oh, yeah. really fast and her bag got caught on the seat <laughs> and it exploded with it. <laughs> Over the last few weeks, it would be surprising if you hadn't heard the term social distancing. Whether that be in a conversation with a friend or in a segment on the news, it has become a part of our new normal to help stop the spread of coronavirus. This has meant avoiding close contact with people, implementing waving instead of a handshake, and swapping face-to-face with FaceTime. While it is vital in slowing down new cases of COVID-19, experts are concerned the saturation of the phrase social distancing is leading to the spread of a different epidemic, loneliness. We have been developed as a social species where there are many facets to how we connect with one another and being social is a big part of that. And so if we don't have that, um, that, that means no connection, we start impacting our mental health because connection is a big part of who we are as human beings. That was Gobind Singh, an impact fellow at RMIT University's Health Transformation Lab. 
he prefers to call it spatial or physical distancing. So, why is language so important when we talk about this? So, social distancing implies that we, we kind of distance socially, and that has a, if we sort of distance socially, it could lead to a greater sense of loneliness, and loneliness then leads to a whole range of health problems, and there's already, you know, the, the guidance already called loneliness uh, an impending pandemic. So we need to look at how our language shapes our thoughts, which then shapes our actions. Singh says that just because we are being told to socially distance doesn't mean we have to disconnect, and that we should harness technology as a means to socialise. We can still feel connected on an intellectual and emotional or a, or a political or spiritual basis with one another. And we can use technology to, to cultivate that sense of connection. Although research on loneliness in Australia is limited, a 2015 survey by Vic Health found one in eight young people aged 16 to 25 felt a very high intensity of being alone. So how do we deal with an epidemic of loneliness in a coronavirus pandemic? Clinical psychologist Chris Mackey says that those still living at home should use this time to renew family social bonds. Families might have an opportunity to renew the way that we can have some kind of social interaction with each other through games, through conversations, through making meal times positive. So I think that will be one of the silver linings that comes up from um, uh, being in seclusion or lockdown, uh, interacting with each other and interacting with our pets. He also suggests that individuals that may be feeling lost during this time should identify their character strengths and this in turn will help them find suitable isolation activities. If our top strength includes kindness, we might think of how we can do a kindness for a a neighbour or helping um, an elderly person understand how, uh, how to get connected on Zoom. If we have a strength in persistence, then we might have tasks or projects that might take two or three months to complete at home, but if we know that that's our top character strength, then if we act on that, then rather than it being a drain, it actually feeds us, it actually benefits us. But above all, Mackie emphasises the importance of exercise as not just being a physical benefit, but a crucial factor for our mental health. In terms of um, physical exercise, especially if it's motivating and engaging in some way, Uh, enjoyable and engaging, going for a run, if people like doing that, that's very good for mental health. And three lots of aerobic exercise of about 45 minutes each a week, like going for a run, can have an equivalent effect to antidepressants. So whether you're feeling isolated, trapped or lonely, it is completely normal to feel lost in a pandemic of this size but feel reassured that everyone is in this together. Call up an old friend, learn a new hobby, or if you feel that way inclined, box dye your hair. Remember that just because some aspects of your life have switched off, it doesn't mean you have to as well. I try and message my friends every day, which is actually more than what I would in like normal day-to-day life. Like usually you have a couple of conversations here or there throughout the week, but since I'm not seeing anyone, I'm like really trying to make the extra effort to message people and ask how they are um, and just like keep updated what they're doing, see if they've got any good ideas to keep busy. That was Phoebe Humphrey there with some really good advice on how we can look after ourselves and a reminder that we don't have to be in close physical contact to be able to look after others as well. For most of us, our time in lockdown has consisted of Zoom meetings, Netflix watch parties and daily ISO walks to get some fresh air. But for some, going online or even going outside is simply out of the question. Australia's elderly population have been told to stay home for their own safety. But what happens when they still need help? 
And will these next few months leave them more alone than ever before? Eliza Sears has more. Robert Dunstan and his wife Ayla have lived across the street from my family for over 20 years. Oh, we moved to Mount Waverley in 1998. Growing up, we would regularly see him driving up the street or run into him at the local shops or in his garage fixing things and making new gadgets. Our interactions didn't often go beyond a hello yelled from our house to his. Over the last few years, Robert's health has deteriorated and with that, his confidence. At the end of 2019, he gave up his driver's licence and with it, much of his independence. He says he's not getting up to much these days. Very, very little. I would like to be doing things that I can't get the confidence to do them. But uh, little things I might do if, if it's night weather, but very little at the moment. Oh, I, always, I like fixing things, Eliza. As your dad would know, I've got plenty of tools in the garage that I can used to repair things and um, make things new again. Robert is a mechanical engineer by trade and spent most of his working life as an expat working on government contracts. He worked in England for many years. It was there he met Ayla. At Christmas 1967. I was working in England at the time and I went for uh, a Christmas break uh, over over the Christmas period, and uh, I finished up in Finland, in Helsinki. Having lived a life full of adventure, Robert, aged 92, and Ayla, 93, now struggle to move around and are mostly housebound. While they would like to go outside, their physical health holds them back. Well, we would like to, Eliza, if we, we're not very capable at the moment. Both of us are a uh, uh, little bit un, uh, unsure of our walking, um, but we keep on trying. Since losing his licence last year, Robert's granddaughter, Carita, has been lending a hand and giving him a ride to the shops once a week, his only social interaction for the week. However, since the government announced new social distancing laws in the last month, in response to the coronavirus outbreak and warned that those over 70 are at greater risk, Robert and Ayla have gone into lockdown. And while Carita continues to do the weekly shop, the couple is stuck at home in isolation for the foreseeable future. Well, uh, as long as we stay at home, I think we have much risk. But it might not be that simple. Since January, the couple have been receiving in-home care a service designed to help the elderly remain independent and out of a nursing home for as long as possible by providing housekeeping, medical support, meal preparation and personal care services. While receiving these services has enabled the couple to remain at home, it means they have no control over who enters their home, more importantly, the health of the care workers. We've got three, four different people coming through the throughout the week, Uh, maybe not that often, but three or four people every two weeks. So we're trusting that they don't have any problem. That's our, our, our biggest worry at the moment. And it's a very real worry. As we now know, some people that test positive for coronavirus are asymptomatic, meaning even with the best of intentions, Someone providing health care to the pair could have the virus without knowing. Life in isolation for Robert and Ayla is drastically different to my own experience. The couple decided some years ago to bow out of the technology game. So, while I have three devices on the go, Wi-Fi connecting everything and constant contact with friends on social media, some 10 metres from my front door, Robin and Ayla only have a landline phone the radio and conversation to keep them entertained. Their only social interactions occur once a week with the healthcare providers and their granddaughter. A drastically different experience to a modern day young adults lockdown. 
but Robert says it's not too bad. Not really. We get, <laughs> not really. We've got time. We've got plenty of room to move around in the house. If we were mm-hmm. living in an apartment, I think it would be a lot different. But because we've got a garden, we can move around and look at things. So that's, that's not too bad. From my conversation with Robert, it was human interaction that he missed most. With the end of this crisis still seemingly a way off, and in a time where most of us feel some level of loneliness, it's important not to forget our elderly neighbours, the ones you might only say a sheepish hello to from your driveway, or that you wave to but have never actually had a conversation with. Reach out. Have a chat on the phone or from a distance. Because while we all go a little stir-crazy over the next few weeks, and probably months, for elderly members of society, like Robert and Ayla, Isolation will continue long after the pandemic has ceased. That was Eliza Sears there. If that hasn't made you want to check in with your loved ones and elderly neighbours, I don't know what will. Hi everyone, it's Tyson here from the Undercover Podcast. I want to thank everyone that tuned into the very first episode last week, the pilot episode of the Undercover Podcast that spoke about freedom. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. It was a pleasure to produce that episode and bring it to you. But for episode three, which is coming out in a couple of weeks' time, we want to hear from you. We want to hear about what new skills, new talents you've picked up during this isolation period. You could have picked up painting, juggling, jigsaw puzzle making, whatever it is. We want to include a message from you in that podcast. If you can give us a call on 03 9018 5005 and leave a voice message to tell us in just 15 to 30 seconds what new skills or talents you've picked up and why, we'll include that message in the third episode coming out in a couple of weeks' time. We certainly hope to hear from you soon. And until then, goodbye. In times of injustice and despair, human beings instinctively come together. We rally, we protest, we gather at vigils. We are a pack of animals and our strength is in numbers. During the bushfire season, arts and music events raise millions of dollars in aid by bringing people together. But COVID-19 has changed that notion and physical isolation is the new form of unity. What does this mean for the arts and music industry, which relies so much on live events and mass gatherings? Leila Arakova reports. I'm just picturing some big celebration. Everybody's in the one spot, big open space. Yeah, I'm not sure what it will be like, but it will be good. This is how Elliot imagines his first night out after lockdown. Elliot runs a group called High Ground, which throws events all around Melbourne. It's mainly been club nights along with smaller events here and there at bars and trying to incorporate as many different things as you can, be that visual arts or anything kind of interactive. Fortunately, this time it probably won't happen for a while. High Ground was in the middle of a new exciting project when the pandemic hit. The group organised a tour for an international act from London, DJ Swing, who was one of the heads behind the label Tone Dropout. We decided to take a few months off from doing regular local parties to work towards that. The tour was meant to kick off on the 24th of April with two shows here in Melbourne and one in Perth. The tour has been postponed till September, for now. Yeah, we just hadn't really done anything like this before. So it was something we're really looking forward to. According to the Australia Council of the Arts, our live music sector generates $15.4 billion and 65,000 full-time and part-time jobs. Now, considering every live event in the country has been cancelled or postponed indefinitely for the remainder of the year, the sector is in shambles. It's crazy how almost overnight everything fell apart. Most artists are self-employed or work as freelancers, and 90% of those who solely rely on music for income do not have the safety net of superannuation or health insurance, according to West Australian Music. This is Lucy. I work for Melbourne Theatre Company as an assistant stage manager most of the time. And I also work as a stage manager and producer for an Indigenous dancer named Jorbe. We were actually overseas in New Zealand when um, our tour got cancelled, so 
we have to come back due to the coronavirus and then cancel the end of the tour, which is quite sad. I think we had six shows, no, eight shows to go. They made the decision that they were going to shut down all shows. Since her return, Lucy's been on a two-week self-quarantine. Melbourne Theatre Company have had to cancel most of their shows for the year. I think they're starting up in September, whatever we do. So I was like four months of full-time work with them. Um, I was about to do two show seasons with them. So that was exciting to have that opportunity. I asked Elliot and Lucy about how they felt when everything they'd been working on was scrapped. This is what they said. Kind of felt like that bad dream. I think at first we were like, oh, okay, that's fine. We can just adapt. We can figure out how to do these. We went along with our meetings and we're like, oh, yeah, we're going to go to Darwin in August. This will be fine. Like, I'm sure that'll all happen. And we were in denial for a while. And then, of course, getting all the cancellations with MTC was probably like the cherry on top of the really bad cake, I guess. Fortunately for Lucy, she's been able to continue working from home. We're looking at doing some video work online as well, so just sort of trying to get creative with what we can at the moment. If you've ever been to a concert, a theatre performance or a comedy stand-up, you know nothing can compare to the atmosphere of a live gig. 50% of Australians attend live performances annually, but now that we are trapped in our homes, we might need to start getting used to the alternatives most notably live streams. I think that artists, especially like dancers and theatre makers, will have come up with so many interesting ways to create art and new mediums as well. So like as we turn to technology now and live streaming things, we're going to start developing a dance show in two weeks and all the dancers are going to be in different rooms and the director is going to be watching a video and is laptop screen, so it's going to be really interesting to see how it works. Although live streaming has been around for a while now, it's never been used to such an extent, from DJ sets and band performances to weddings, and now even Easter masses moving online. Yeah, I think the live streams are a great idea of, you know, being able to make the best of a bad situation. I myself am going to be involved with a few live streams coming up, which will be fun. Although Elliot admits he's had his down weeks, he tries to look for the silver lining. I feel like that there is going to be a lot of positive creativity coming out of this. You know, you stick someone in a room with all the equipment for a few months with nothing else to do, and surely there's going to be a lot of new music coming out. What do you miss most about life before isolation? I think the social aspect. For sure, for me, is the biggest loss. Yeah, that... That probably hurts the most. Uh, although we can stay connected virtually, it's um, still not the same for me anyway. Second from that is probably seeing music on decent big sound systems definitely beats my little crappy speakers I've got. Several initiatives have been set up to stimulate creativity and support struggling artists. The City of Melbourne is offering four to $5,000 grants to 250 artists who may choose to work in any medium. You just need to explain your concept and how the money will be used. Radio companies are encouraged to play local music to support Australian musicians. And SoundCloud introduced a new button to artist profiles, which enables direct financial support from fans via platforms like PayPal. I'm just sort of... That, that the curve will fun and then we're slowly allowed to get together in smaller groups at least and just keep on creating art together because I think that humans are really now realising that you need a community to create. What are you looking forward to most after lockdown? Well, I mean, it will probably take a while for theatres and festivals and things to sort of get back up and running. That's probably what I'm looking forward to most. Mainly just a beer and a pub. Be nice, surrounded by people. You don't even have to know them. Layla Arakova there. If you're an artist, crew member, or a music worker, and you've been affected by the coronavirus outbreak, jump on supportact.org.au for financial assistance and mental support.
Natural disasters can bring out the best and the worst in people. Some want to help those around them in any way they can, while others can get a little bit selfish. But then there's the other type of people who try to make money off those who've fallen into hard times. Social media can make us a lot more suspicious. And as journalists, we're trained to be sceptical, but the reality could often be more interesting. In this next story, what looked like a scam or a soulless bot turned out to be something surprising. In this segment, John Moyle looks at the online world of disaster fraud. Maybe it's because I'm locked in my apartment, but this past week I've been feeling obsessive. One thing in particular I've been obsessing over are scams, because what I didn't know until recently is natural disasters, like our current pandemic, are a boom for scammers. Aptly named disaster fraud, these are scams that profit in the wake of large climatic events. Cassandra Cross, an Australian cybersecurity expert who wrote about scams targeting this summer's bushfire victims, said negative life events can make a person more vulnerable to fraud. And after disasters, people are highly motivated to donate money. Both of these things are what scammers target. In relation to coronavirus, there is every type of scam imaginable. Scamwatch, ran by the ACCC, lists scams every day people in Australia need to look out for. Cute puppies up for adoption, sold at a discount for someone needing company in self-isolation, The puppies, obviously, aren't real, although their $1,200 price tag is. There are cures for coronavirus, special immune boosters and secret remedies, unlimited Netflix or Woolworths food vouchers if you just follow the link, and of course, there are the fraudulent charities or COVID-19 tracking sites that deliver malware. Through following this, I noticed a comment by someone named Tim. He was asking Scamwatch to look into a Twitter account called COVID-19 Australia. He writes they have almost 40,000 followers, but don't mention what or who the money is donated to. When I read that, I thought, wait a minute, I follow COVID-19 Australia. And then I thought, if Scamwatch isn't investigating this for Tim, then I can. First of all, Tim is right. This account, to me, does look sus. It's a Twitter account reposting COVID data. It has a link to a website which shows account details and how to donate money to someone called Jess. But the weird thing is, it gained 50,000 followers in a couple of weeks. So, I turned to the internet. There are a lot of guides and tools to help you investigate dodgy Twitter accounts and websites. Apparently a good place to start is Whois, the domain register which can tell you who owns a website. If there is barely any information, it's not looking good. Needless to say, this Twitter account wasn't looking good. Next, I moved on to my favourite pandemic pastime so far, bot spotting. What I was most suspicious of from the beginning was the followers. 50,000 in a month is a pretty good haul. So there's a free tool called Fake Followers Audit by SparkToro, where you plug in a Twitter handle and see an evaluation of who or what follows the account. COVID-19 Australia scored high, with more fake followers than most. Out of its 50,000, 27% are suspicious. On top of this, there was also the amount of posts. Since COVID-19 started in early March, it's posted over 1,900 times. That averages out to about 60 a day. At this point, I was kind of getting a bit riled up. I felt like I was onto something, so I sent an email to an old journalism teacher who was essentially a guru in the dark arts of the internet. I apologised for the email, it was a bit too long but said, I'm just obsessed with this account. Is it likely that many of its followers are bots? Do you come across accounts like this often? What is the point of this? If it's a scam, what kind of scam is it? He replied quickly, saying it has attracted a lot of followers. And I was right, there's bots. Around a quarter of the followers do look to be fake. But then he said, there is a lot of interest in this, so a lot of the people following it are probably real. And to know you'd have to go through the followers one by one. He said the website is simple, but not dodgy, and ultimately, he decided to found, as he called it, a great resource for journalism. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm glad it's not a scam, but I'm still left with some questions. Who is Jess? And why are they doing all this work? 
Why are they tracking COVID-19 by the hour in their spare time? So I sent an email and eventually I got Jess on the phone. Um, yeah, so why did you begin the website? Uh, so I had been tracking COVID since, I don't know, I, since we first got our the reports out of Wuhan and then just watching country after country after country blowing up and there wasn't a lot of available information. There's a couple of websites um, with numbers and uh, I don't know, I just, I just went looking for Australian data and when I couldn't find anything and couldn't see any tally or, um, you know, what, what the rise was looking like, I just created it. <laughs> so my job, I do risk management. So uh, I do a lot of work on predicting catastrophic events and oh, really? um, you know, putting, putting controls in place and things like that. So it's very much sparked my interest in a in the business continuity sense. So, you know, I was two to three months ago I was sitting there looking around the world going, wow, this is, we're going to have a lot of unemployment, we're going to have, um, you know, what are other countries doing? And I'm really interested to see how businesses bounce back from this. Um, and, you know, what does that mean for small business? What does that mean for schools? What does that mean? <coughs> Excuse me, that's not coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I've been thinking about this since January. And like I said, that's, that's how my brain works. Can you tell me a bit about what the reaction to the site has been like? Because it seems like there's just been so much success so quickly in terms of followers and engagement. Oh, look, I'm, I'm dumbfounded, not dumbfounded, I'm just amazed at how, uh, amazed and also not surprised. I mean, I go looking for data, I go looking for information, and I think in a situation like this, there's not a lot you can control, so whether or not it's, you know, people in jobs or whether or not we can buy toilet paper or, or things like this. So I think the one thing that we can control is what we know, uh, and I think that's my contribution, I think, uh, I want to know what what I want to know what the trend looks like. I want to know what what um, you know what situation Australia is going to be in in a week or you know a month's time. Um, so I think that's just the one thing that we can control. And if people can get updated and use the data, I think it's just been very well received. Yeah, and because of the success, I kind of have a confession in a sense. It's kind of embarrassing because of the success of your account and how many followers you had. I kind of thought you were like a like a scam. <laughs> Followed oh, by... Oh, really? And no, 100%, 100% organic. Yeah, I can see that now. Yeah, and look, I've only had that Twitter account for one month, exactly. So I'm just blown away. Thanks so much for talking to me. That's okay, John. Um, and yeah, good luck with it. And stay safe. That was John Moyle there with an absolutely captivating piece. Now, John's continuing his quest to find the scammers, so you should definitely tune into future episodes to find out how he goes. John is on the case. And if you know of a scam or see anything, make sure you give us a call or send us a message on Twitter. In our final story for this episode, we're looking at dating in isolation. Relationships are tricky at the best of times, so what happens when you add a global pandemic and a strict stay-at-home rule into the mix? For many of us, the answer is not a positive one. But that doesn't have to be the case. Here's Jess Boland on how to handle love and relationships when you can't even leave your house. In the age of COVID-19, navigating the dating world has never been harder. Whether you're stuck with your partner day in, day out for the foreseeable future, or you and your boo are forced to isolate apart, it seems the virus is taking a toll on everybody's love life. This is Brayden. Oh, fuck. He's a 21-year-old plumber and has the vocab to prove it. Brayden's just started a very new relationship. Um, yeah, I'm seeing somebody, but not like in a relationship relationship, just like the bit before being in a relationship. Probably been pretty serious, like two months, maybe. While this is normally the most exciting time in any relationship, with a nationwide lockdown looming, Brayden is struggling to see the future of his relationship when the two can't even see each other in person. I don't know, well, things can change in, you know, like, a couple months' time, and, like, if we can't see each other, then, I don't know, she might just prefer 
then by herself for a bit. I don't know. Just talking on my mind. I guess not really a relationship, is it? But don't worry. He's not all doom and gloom. We talk every day and stuff like that. I don't know. Like, there's always FaceTime, isn't there? You can always FaceTime. You got fucking Snapchat. So, I don't know. Like, it's not like we're going to be completely out of contact. Nothing's really going to change in the emotional, like, department of that sort of stuff and mentality of it. I think it'll just be more finally we get to see each other. Plenty of people all around the world are sure to be feeling just as pessimistic about their relationships. From feeling stir-crazy with your partner to feeling lonely in lockdown, a global pandemic isn't the best time for love. Right? Hi, I'm Samantha Jane. I'm a relationship expert and dating coach, and you can find me at samanthajane.com.au. Wrong. Couples counsellor Samantha Jane thinks this time, while fraught and scary, is a time for relationships to thrive. The thing is, divorce lawyers, and I have to agree, have predicted there will be a huge amount of breakups, huge amount of divorces. What's really important at this point in time is to just be really kind to each other. You're going to drive each other nuts. You're going to be in each other's faces. But you have a choice. You have a choice to look at this as an opportunity to connect. You know, talk to your partner about how they feel. And don't just assume, oh, they're fine, I'm fine, this is no big deal, or because some of your partner might actually be really scared. And if they're not able to talk to you, they'll talk to others and connect with others instead. And for those forced to separate, like Brayden, now is not the time to give up hope. They can talk on the phone more, they can actually reach out more and then get to know each other and actually build a stronger connection. Just think absence makes the heart grow fonder. So get creative with connecting via video chat. Think about how amazing it's going to be when you actually get to physically be with each other and physically touch each other. For anyone who has found themselves unlucky in love right now, your luck might be about to change. Samantha reckons singles are the ones who can benefit the most from a lockdown society. In an age where we're forced to interact through screens, it's time for dating apps to shine. People out there right now are more genuine, they are connecting more, they've slowed down, they're not ghosting as much, they're really communicating. So now is actually a really amazing time for you because you have time to reach out, to connect. The sites aren't full of the players because the players, well, they they don't, they can't, there's no hookup. You can't do that. So they're gone. So the people that want something more serious are on there. So be proactive. If you do happen to connect with someone right now, romantically, like think, just imagine the connection that you'll have because you've been through something that's really life-changing. So don't lose hope, Australia. Times are grim, things are hard, but now is not the time to give up. It's not in our nature. Now's the time to explore, to excite and to innovate. Sure. It may feel like the world is ending, but that does not mean your love life has to. That was Jess Boland there, and what a positive note to end on. Maybe we shouldn't race to delete those dating apps. Although if someone doesn't reply, they're definitely not busy, so maybe we should. It's really hard not to feel trapped right now. Our houses and our bedrooms are turning into our offices and our lecture halls. We don't get to see the people we care about most in the world. But don't give up. We are one day closer to getting back to normal. Go for a run around the block. Reach out to those who may be lonely and make sure you take the time to really look after your mental health. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been the second episode of the Undercover Podcast. I want to say a big thanks to our reporters for producing such great stories. Alexandra Middleton, Eliza Sears, Jess Boland, Phoebe Humphrey, Leila Arakova, and John Moyle. And a big thanks to our producers, April Austin and Sai Shri, and executive producers, Tito Ambio and Janet Rogers. Be sure to follow us on social media, Twitter at cover underscore podcast, and leave us a message by calling 3 9018 and share your experiences of this unfolding pandemic. 
I've been your host, Aidan Dawkins, recording on the lands of the Jar Jar Wurrung people. This has been Undercover, the podcast. Stay safe, stay home, stay warm. And remember, we are all in this together. Thank you.